Hello and welcome to Bewilder Beasts. I am your host, Melissa McHugh McGrath, still recording from the tiniest podcast studio closet outside of Boston, Massachusetts. And today in Bewilder Beasts, we are going to talk about a snake named Emily Spinach. Pandas have the worst disguises. And the hilariously creepy wild taxidermy room where dead animals go to live in infamy finally gives up its ghost. Okay, let's go. In a few minutes, you're going to hear about a snake named Emily Spinach, my new favorite pet to ever have been in the White House. But first, I did want to start today by asking a favor. If you could take a few seconds to go over to iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcast and rate and review this show, it would really help get this little show a bit more visibility. I know it's a pain, especially if you're walking your dog or you're out washing the dishes, but I'm going to try to make it up to you. I know it's a big ask. But there is a thing called an algorithm, and that's a fancy way of saying podcast catchers will play shows that other people like and show only those podcasts to more people if people say they already like them. I don't know how this algorithm works specifically. I think it's magic, but I'm told it's math somehow. So in short, leave a review, you are entered into a drawing, three names will be chosen, and those three people will get either a sticker or a story. So if you have a minute, go leave a review. We have some fun ones coming up, like Nikola Tesla's fascination with pigeons. And I'm working on an all-cat special, so stay tuned. If you have ideas for the show, go to bewilderbeastpod.com and go to the contact link. There you can find all sorts of ways to submit your favorite animals and how they intersect with humanity. Tell me also about the other favorite podcasts that you are listening to right now. I'm listening to Ologies with Allie Ward. And if you haven't heard her show yet, there's some cursing, but she dives into a specific branch of study in each episode, like urban rodentology or the study of sewer rats. She has one on medusaology, the study of jellyfish, and more. My favorite, one I think y'all will like, is pedagogology. I still can't say it, despite listening to the episode twice. It's the field of science communication with none other than Mr. Science himself, Bill Nye the Science Guy. All of it. It's so cool. So get on that too. And with that said, let's get on with the show. Giant pandas. They have the weirdest parties. Hear me out. I know, they're wild animals, so really what kind of parties could they have? What kind of shenanigans are they getting up to? I mean, they don't have party hats or game night. They go for a stroll, sniff the air, make a run for the hills, and then roll around in glorious, splendiferous, amazing, odiferous horse poop. Maybe it's the newest goop fad on the panda internet? And I feel really bad for the scientists who ended up studying this. Science is messy, y'all. According to Live Science, in 10 years of observing quindling pandas in the wild, scientists began to notice that the bears would frequently display certain behaviors when they are encountering fresh horse dung. They would sniff the manure, rub the manure with their cheeks, roll in the manure, and finally smear the manure all over their bodies. It's not just a little poop, like if your dog rolls around in something the geese left behind. This is a full-body paint job, like Mystique from X-Men, like Braveheart painted blue, like Gamora in Guardians of the Galaxy painted fully green. But Panda Heart is head-to-toe coated in dung brown. I don't think this character is going to end up getting picked up by Disney Plus anytime soon. These bears are 250 pounds and fully coated in poop. That is a lot, a lot, a lot of poop. And all the pandas do it. Timmy, just because Johnny's rolling around in horse poop doesn't mean you should do it too. If he jumped off a bridge, would you? I looked at the photos and these pandas looked like brown bears in a really weird costume. They were so brown and gross, but... There were obvious patches of panda sneaking out, like a white collar where they couldn't quite get poo-tastic, black eye patches, and eating bamboo. So are these costume parties for pandas? Some role-playing pandas? Disgusting disguises? Are they going into panda witness protection? Because if so, they're going to need 
better handlers. It turns out that these horse poop bathing parties are possibly a way for the pandas to stay warm. They seem to do it more as the temperatures dropped in the mountains where they lived. These fecal festivals occur usually when the weather is below 59 degrees Fahrenheit and the poo party pauses when the temps rise above 68 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, is it just horse poop or all poop? Well, the scientist who drew the short straw discovered that horse manure has two compounds in it that are uncommon in other poop, BCP and BCPO, and a whole lot of PU. So scientists took these two compounds and they put it on hay and dunghills that were not horsey made. So no naturally occurring BCP and BCPO were in those hills or dunghills. Because it's science, they had hills with these compounds and hills without. And guess what? The pandas rolled up onto the poo hills that had the BCP and BCPO. And that makes scientists think that maybe in old tiny times, when trade routes were traveled by horses, the pandas figured out that the creatures had compounds in their poop that might dull nerve receptors in their skin. And that might make them feel less cold in the winter months on the mountain. How cool is that? There are still a lot of questions left to answer, but so far, this is pretty cool. I mean, gross and disgusting, but still pretty cool. And that's Bewilderbeasts in a nutshell. There is a ton of buzz right now about having pets back in the White House. We've talked extensively about Pole, Andrew Jackson's swearing parrot that has been evicted from Andrew Jackson's funeral for swearing. And is the sound effect that we continue to use for bleeping out our own cursing on Bewilderbeasts. Hey, Pole, how you doing? Oh, buddy, I've missed you. But there are other presidential pets worthy of Bewilderbeast note. For starters, let's acknowledge the two presidents who broke tradition and had zero pets in the White House. James Polk, the 11th president, and Donald Trump, the 45th president. And this is why so many people are excited about Champ and Major, the two dogs, including a rescue dog, preparing to take daily jaunts out on the White House lawn. Though, I'd argue that some of the animals who resided in America's house weren't really pets, like President James Buchanan's eagle, Pete the squirrel owned by Warren G. Harding, Kelvin Coolidge's bobcat, pygmy hippopotamus named Billy, and three ducks that Mrs. Coolidge tried to raise in a bathroom but eventually had to send to a zoo. Then there's Teddy Roosevelt's animals, which included 10 domestic dogs, two ponies, two cats, five guinea pigs, a hen, a one-legged rooster named Fierce, <coughs> a lizard, a macaw named Eli Yale, Jonathan the rat, a pig, and then some more unusual critters, like a baby bear named Jonathan Edwards, Josiah the badger, Bill the laughing hyena, and a barn owl. But my favorite of the Roosevelt Zoo? Alice Roosevelt's pet garter snake named Emily Spinach. It's said that the snake was named as it was as green as spinach, but as thin as her Aunt Emily. This naming convention totally made sense. I pictured little Alice Roosevelt, maybe four or five, carrying a snake with this naming convention. It totally works, right? But Alice Roosevelt was 17 when she went to live in the White House. She is known to be the sassiest occupant of the White House, and there is plenty of info to back that up. I don't think Emily Spinach was actually a cutesy name. I think it was an insult to her Aunt Emily. Teddy Roosevelt became president after the assassination of President William McKinley Jr. And as soon as Alice Roosevelt, age 17, arrived in her stunning ball gowns, she became an immediate fashion icon. But she didn't talk like a fashion icon. She didn't act like a fashion icon. She didn't act polite for polite sake. It had to be earned. And she felt strongly that a woman shouldn't be treated differently or like things they had to because they were women. And she demanded respect just as any man of the day would. For example, when Senator Joseph McCarthy, a man who was deeply problematic, sat next to her and announced to a room, here's my blind date. I'm going to call you Alice. She spat back, Senator McCarthy, you are not going to call me Alice. 
The truckman, the trash man, and the policeman on my block may call me Alice, but you may not. Respect is earned, y'all. She was fiercely independent, had her snake named Emily Spinach, smoked cigarettes in public and on the White House roof, rode in cars with men. And if you're picturing her as a passenger, oh, you're doing it wrong. She was the driver, racing down Washington, D.C. streets, chewing gum, wore, gasp, pants. In 1904, she stayed out late partying, she placed bets with bookies. Her dad, the president, was worried about getting reelected solely based on Alice's, quote, unladylike behavior. And he frequently found out what she was up to when he would open up the newspaper the next morning. Alice's stepmother's friend described Alice as like a young wild animal that had been put in good clothes. Alice was the first first daughter to serve as a goodwill ambassador with men from Congress, but even though she was there as an ambassador, she was still Alice, and I love her evermore for it. While on a diplomatic mission, a, hey other country, the U.S. wants to be your friend, where people usually walk stiffly, shake hands, smile for the cameras, not Alice. She jumped into a pool fully clothed and encouraged a congressman to do the same. When she was called out for this aberrant behavior, she rightfully pointed out that the clothes she had on, a linen skirt and shirt, were not any different than what women had to wear as a swimsuit of the time. The scandal was unfounded. She had her clothes on. She argued had she taken off her clothes and that would have been a different story. I imagine her saying all of this, while puffing on a cigar and winking at the camera in the prettiest gown of ever. She cut her wedding cake with a sword. And instead of leaving a welcome present for the new president, President Taft, she instead buried a voodoo doll of Mrs. Taft in the front yard and was banished from the White House. Teddy Roosevelt, the president, even once commented after Alice continued to interrupt him in the Oval Office that he should just throw her out the window. He then said to his friend, I can either run the country or I can attend to Alice, but I cannot possibly do both. We've talked about it before. She would have been diagnosed with hysteria for sure. But the Roosevelts aren't the only ones with a long list of White House pets. Kelvin Coolidge was the 30th president, and they had quite a list, too. Aside from 11 dogs, donkeys, a wallaby, enough birds to do a full reenactment of the 12 Days of Christmas, antelopes, and more, one animal sticks out, Rebecca, a raccoon. Now, Rebecca wasn't just any old raccoon. She was supposed to be dinner, and not just any dinner, Thanksgiving dinner. Rebecca Raccoon was given a presidential pardon when Mrs. Coolidge decided she'd keep Rebecca as a pet instead of dinner. She then had a collar embroidered for the wild animal and let her participate in Easter egg hunts, which, by all accounts, Rebecca really enjoyed. And because this was a wild animal with hands who was allowed to be free in the White House, she got into mischief. She unscrewed light bulbs. She was known to steal things from drawers. Oh, bust of Abe Lincoln. He he he. Don't mind if I do. And she frequently unpotted plants. They had made a house outside for Rebecca that she would hang out in from time to time, which was rather sweet. But after leaving the White House, Rebecca was donated to a zoo, which made sense. She was tame enough to exist with people, which might have been a problem. They couldn't set her free. But Rebecca sadly died in captivity. She didn't adjust to living in a zoo. But the house they built for her at the White House ended up serving another purpose. When Herbert Hoover, the next president, moved in, a wild possum took up residence in Rebecca's old house. The Hoovers unofficially adopted the possum and named it Billy Possum, where he did what possums do, keep ticks away and help with insect management. They are America's only marsupial, and possums are awesome. Billy Opossum went on to be a pinch hitter of a sort when a kid's baseball team lost their live possum mascot. They were convinced their winning streak was due to America's only marsupial, and they were understandably heartbroken. So when President Hoover heard about this, he had aides send Billy Opossum to the Hyattsville High School team. And when they won the championship, 
They sent Billy back to Hoover, and he likely escaped to go back to the wild. If you have any other ideas about presidential pets, or if you are curious about presidential pets at all, there is a website for you, and it is called presidentialpetmuseum.com. And there you can learn about all the White House pets, some wild animals that have been in there, including two alligators that we did not talk about today. There's trivia. There's a blog. They have a gift shop. I wonder if you can get an Emily spinach snake. Anyway, it is there for you to peruse, to browse, and, you know, just be careful when you get to pull the parrot's website. I'm pretty sure it's rated R. The Australian Letter is the New York Times Australia update which for some reason just tickled me to no end. And very recently, they had an article that absolutely bumped everything else I had planned to do for today to future episodes. The headline, saying goodbye to Melbourne's weird and wonderful taxidermy. Taxidermy is essentially taking dead animals and preserving them in a way that could be used for display, research, art, keeping them lifelike. If you've ever been to a natural history museum or the Boston Museum of Science, there are taxidermied animals everywhere that show just how large a real brown bear is compared to a kindergartner or how large a tiger's mouth is. But taxidermy is as much a science as an art. And like art, some of it is quite good and some of it is hilariously bad. This particular display was hilariously bad. It's the taxidermy version of what we have here in my city, the Museum of Bad Art. It's in the basement of the local indie theater, and if you have entry to the theater, your ticket also gets you into this remarkable room. The MOBA displays not just bad art, but bad art that tried to be good and just missed the mark. The MOBA and the Melbourne taxidermy display are both like your dad thinking he's getting you a gift that you really want for Christmas. And he misheard CD player and got you a CB radio. Sometimes the letdown in hindsight is funny. I mean, I eventually got over it. This taxidermy room has what is affectionately called sad otter. But otters aren't sad. Oh, This one is. Not only is he dead, but his body looks more like a potato that has turned with its eyes preserved for eternity like he's watching a murder. His feet are splayed in a way that I had only ever seen once before during my ninth month of pregnancy. According to the New York Times report, my sister pointed out one animal in particular, an otter with an expression so wonky and forlorn it sent me into fits of uncontrollable giggles. This, of course, was Sad Otter, who has since acquired a modicum of internet fame. You can now buy Sad Otter plush toys at the museum gift shop. It is thought that Sad Otter got his bizarre appearance because the taxidermist who worked on him may never have seen a live otter. Whatever the cause, he is not alone. While the otter is probably the weirdest specimen in the collection, he is one of many to appear with a certain macabre shoddiness. I am quite fond of flea-bitten lion, disintegrating bat, and mangy bandicoot. Many of these specimens are over 100 years old, and it shows. End quote. So if you are not grossed out by this sort of thing, I implore you to look at the resources for today's episode and look up the two bad taxidermy links. The one from Ranker is perfect. They might otherwise be considered nightmare fuel, but to me, they look like maybe a Wes Anderson animator licked some of those cane toads from a few episodes back, then tried to make animals in the fantastic Mr. Fox. One is a mountain lion that is smirking, literally smirking, and eyeing visitors as if to hat tip and say, I know what you did. One is a squirrel that looks like it should be saying, paint me like one of your French girls, but is just trying way too hard. Most of the cats are wide-eyed and cross-eyed. A few animals, you don't even know what they're supposed to be, or if someone just tried to take leftover parts and Frankenstein something totally new. Every image is funnier than the one before, and I highly recommend this if you're into this weird macabre sort of thing like I am. And if this totally grosses you out, I'm really sorry. If you just want to look at one that is really funny and not gross or misshapen in any way, go look at the donkey. The donkey has two metal sticks for legs because it just doesn't have enough legs to be a donkey. And if that is funny enough for you, awesome. Every image is funnier than the one before. 
and I highly recommend this if you are into this weird, macabre sort of thing, like I am. So thank you for joining me today on Bewilder Beasts. If you like this podcast, please share and tell all of your friends. And don't forget, take a minute today to go rate and review on iTunes or Spotify or wherever you listen to your podcasts. It truly is the best way to support this little show. If there are topics that you would be interested in hearing about on the podcast, know of any historical animals who changed the world, animals who help humans, wacky animals in the news, or just something really silly, there are multiple ways to send them in, or just let me know what you think of the show. Visit the website, bewilderbeastpod.com. There, you can find episodes to start with, share episodes, learn about the show, how to support the show, see bonus art for some of the podcast episodes, and more. Email bewilderbeastpod at gmail.com. Tweet at bewilderbeastspod. You can DM or voice text over at bewilderbeastpod on Facebook. I want to make sure that this is an accessible medium for everyone. So if you are too little to type, or if you have a difficult time with writing or using tiny keyboards, Feel free to use the voice text feature instead if that's easier for you or your littles to share facts. The voice text feature allows a person to leave a one minute voice message on their favorite animal, fact, or resource for the show. Or just lurk over at Bewilderbeast on Instagram. I'm Melissa McHugh McGrath, co-training director of the New England Dog Training Club, author of Considerations for the City Dog, and creator of Mutt Stuff Media and this podcast. Now go get curious. I got today's information from the childrensmuseum.org, politico.com, washingtonpost.com, wikipedia, news.google.com, patch.com on the Maryland Hyattsville Hoover opossum bringing luck to Hyattsville baseball teams, livescience.com on pandas rolling in horse poo, sciencemag.org, collections.museumsvictoria.com on the taxidermy museum, Mashable.com and Ranker.com on the list of bad taxidermy pictures by Ashley Rain. Links are in the description of today's episodes. Intro music is Tiptoe Out the Back by Dan Leibowitz and interstitial music is all by MK2. Please don't forget to like, subscribe, review, and share with your curious friends. You know, all the things every other podcast tells you to do. Thank you so much for listening and I will see you next week.